The next example I want to look into is that of map many. And I want to give you a particular use case for it in the form of a problem that we can solve together. But before we go into that, I want to point out that I've made a couple of changes. Um, you're going to have to make those changes as well if you want to follow along and run this code that we're going to write next. So the first change I made is in the plus function, I passed an initial value of zero to the call to reduce. And that's because we may invoke plus without any arguments, in which case we just want to return the number zero. And I've done the same thing in the times function here. I now pass in zero as an initial value to reduce here as well. And that's because if we repeat something zero times, meaning we want to multiply, say, zero by four, well, then we want to return the number zero. If we don't do this, then uh, the plus function is never invoked because there's nothing to reduce over because this array is empty that's repeated by, that's returned by repeat. And so um, the call to reduce would actually return undefined by default. Okay, so with that out of the way, just be sure to make those two changes if you want to code this and code along. Um, Consider the following problem. Imagine you're given an array of digits that represent a binary number. So these digits, for example, represent the binary number 1011. And you're given the task of uh, transforming this into a decimal number. Now, how might one go about this? Well, you can think about it this way. Basically, when you are given a binary number like this, each digit and its position tell you something about the value of the entire binary number. And that is the following. Um, you basically read it from right to left. And we still do this with decimal numbers too. It's just with decimal numbers, it's become second nature. So we're not as aware of this process. But with binary digits, or with binary numbers, you, um, I should call them binary numerals, I guess, because they're all the same numbers behind these, these different representations. But in any case, um, what you do is you read it from right to left, and every um, digit here is a coefficient of the value that's sort of implicit in its position. So the rightmost value, the rightmost um, digit um, rep has an implicit value of two to the power of zero. This next one has an implicit value of two to the power of one. This next one has an implicit value of two to the power of two. And this one has an implicit value of two to the power of three. So if you read it in order from left to right, um, this right here, is the algorithm that you would use to calculate this. So you'd say one times two to the power of three, and then zero times two to the power of two, one time two to the power of one, and one time two to the power of zero. Now I find it easier to reverse this collection because then the powers that you raise the number two to increase rather than decrease, as you can see here. So this line, it does the same thing, just with the digits reversed. And I've also uh, untangled this a little bit and turned this into this graphic down here. So basically what we want is if we read this from top to bottom, this column of digits is like this line, but in reverse. So this number one corresponds to this number one, this number one corresponds to this number one and so forth. So what we want to do is we want to multiply each digit by its implicit value. And then once we've done that for all of them, we want to add up all the results. Now, if you've been paying attention and you, you, you've sort of become familiar with the functional approach, uh, maybe this last step, add them, adding them all up together, is already a clue as to what we might be doing, namely using reduce and the plus function. But before we get to that, let's, um, let's look into how we might traditionally do this. So traditionally, 
we would write a function like this, binary to decimal, let's call it. And let's say we are given uh, an array of binary digits. And as always, we would start out with some sort of result that we prepare. And then I recommend just for convenience, what I did here is uh, let's reverse those digits first because then we can treat them in increasing uh, order rather than decreasing order. So let's call this reverse digits equals binary digits in reverse. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate as always. And um, this is going to be the reverse digits length. And we're simply going to, to iterate over the, the digits. And then we're going to reassign the result at every time at every point in the iteration, every time we iterate. And it's simply going to be reverse digits, this current reverse digit times two to the power of i. So this this way we start it with zero and then we say one times two to the power of zero plus whatever we started out with. Okay. And then at the next iteration, uh, result is set to that result. And then we say reverse digits at i is now this one times two to the power of one. And then we increase the result by that much and so forth. And at the very end, we return the result, and that's basically it. So let's run this to see if it works. So binary to decimal, let's say we're given this collection of binary digits. Oh, I mistyped it. And there you go. This number is 11. Let's make sure this is actually correct. One times two to the power of zero um, two to the power of zero is not zero. Two to the power of zero is one. In fact, anything to the power of zero is one. So two, so one times one is one. Then one times two is two. That's three plus zero plus, and this is eight because it's one times two to the power of three and two to the power of three is eight. So eight plus two plus one is indeed 11. So this seems to be working. But of course, this is again the traditional approach and we want to practice the functional approach. So how might we do this differently? Well, first, uh, the first thing to note is that we are using built-in functions like this reverse, this call to reverse. We're also using this call to dot length. When you do something like that, that's always a good indication that you may want to put these guys into their own separate functions. So I've already gone into how one might build a reverse function. And it's very simple. Oops. Basically all you do is you use reduce. And what you do in here is you return uh, a new array where you put the current item in front of the ones that you've already um, taken care of. And you want to iterate over all of them and return an array. So you pass in an empty array as an initial value. So that's all you need to do for reduce. Let me run this just to make sure that this works. And that works great. Okay, and then the other thing I pointed out is that the call to dot length, uh, what you may want to do instead is have a method, let's say, let's call it count, like in closure, that just returns a collection's length. Now, what good is it to have these in separate functions? Well, now you can treat these as first-class citizens. Um, you, can, uh, you can use them in a call to map, for example 
which you couldn't do if you had to access them directly on some object like we did here. So that's the benefit of having these as standalone functions. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, let's implement the functional approach to, um, to this problem of how to parse a, a binary uh, numeral and turn it into a decimal numeral. And this is where map many comes in. So as I said earlier, what, what you may have noticed is that at the end, we're going to reduce using plus, but here we have this thing going on where we want to multiply um, pairs of things, and we want to do this at every iteration. So it would be nice if there was a way to iterate over the binary digits that were given and simultaneously iterate over the implicit values that are in the second column and create pairs of them so that we can multiply them and then have a collection of the results because then what we can do is we can reduce the plus function over them. So let's see what this looks like in action. Um, basically what we need is something called map many. I mean, we can call it that. I don't know if anybody else calls it that. And what it's gonna take, just like the map function, is going to take uh, a function f, and it's, now it's going to take any number of collections, not just one collection, but it's going to take any number of them. And if you think about map this way, you can see that the regular map function is really just one special case of this map many function where you happen to only pass in one collection. Okay, and then what we're going to do is very standard is we're going to check again, is something empty? Now, what is empty here? Well, we're going to have a, a sort of heuristic. We're going to say that we're going to assume that all the collections are of equal size. Um, I think the way Closer handles it, for example, is they say it, they don't have to be of equal size, but they trim the bigger ones down to the minimum to the length of the smallest one. But for simplicity, we're just going to assume that they all have the same size. And what that means is if the first collection is empty, that means all collections are empty. So that's how we check for that. So if, if they're all empty, well, then we can just return an empty array because there's nothing to do. If they're not all empty, now what we need to do is take the values of each collection, but only the first value of each collection. So we're going to map first over all the collections. So this is how uh, map is really just a special case, again, of map many, where in the case of map, you take the first value of the single collection you're given, in this case, we're going to take the first values of all the collections that were given. And now what we're going to do is we're going to invoke the function that we're given with these values. Now, why do we need the splat operator here? Because vals at this point is an array. Map always returns an array. And we want to invoke this function not with an array, but with each value individually as an argument list. Okay, and then once we're done with that, we can construct a new list that we want to return eventually with the result of that function invocation. And then we're just going to use map many again with the same function. And now we're going to pass the rest of each collection. So we can use map again and map the rest function over the collections that we were given. But careful, we also need to use the splat operator here because we don't take an array of collections in our map many function, we take an argument list of collections, of individual collections. So this is what's going to allow us to multiply each of these as we iterate over both collections simultaneously. So this is really kind of a neat um, extension of map 
this map many function. So now that we can do this, we should be able to create these pairs and then reduce the plus function over them to get the result. So, and by the way, I just noticed that I haven't been sticking to a naming convention here. So let's make this underscore because that's what I've been using throughout this file. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's write our binary to decimal function. Let's call our old one old. and say binary to decimal is going to take some binary digits. Then the first thing we're going to do, just like in our traditional example, is we're going to reverse them. But this, this time we're going to actually use the reverse helper method that we extracted out. And now what we have to create is we have to, um, we're going to want to basically create um, the this column. We're, we're going to want to co create a collection that represents this column of implicit values. Now, what you can see here maybe is that the exponents the powers that we're raising the base 2 to are increasing linearly. It's just 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So this is something that we can use the iterate function for. So iterate of inc and starting at 0. And how many of them do we want? Well, as many as we have reverse digits. Now, what do we do with this function? Well, we want to raise the base two to each of them. And that's, we can just use a standard map for that because we're basically transforming each of the exponents into something else. And then what we'll end up with is a collection that represents this column. So um, instead of just using iterate here, what we really want to do is map over um, each of these items that iterate returns. And what we're going to do in our map function is raise two to the number uh, that's returned by the iterate function. And the result of iterate is what we're going to map over. Okay. Now what we have is this column right here, this column of implicit values. We know what the value at each position in the binary digits collection represents. And so now what we can do, actually I need to still assign this to a variable here. Let's call them binary positions. I could also call them implicit values. Maybe that's clearer. So now what we can do is we can reduce everything that we have and say plus. But remember that we still need to multiply each of these guys. We haven't really done anything yet with the binary digits that we were given. All we've done so far is we've reversed them. But we still have to combine them somehow with the implicit values. That's where map many comes in. We can combine each of them and iterate over both collections simultaneously, so to speak, by saying map many using the times function over the reverse oops, digits and the implicit values. So let's run this and see if it works. Binary to decimal, and let's pass in the same example. And I used the wrong naming convention again. Let's try it again. Binary 
binary to decimal. And there you have it. So this seems to be working. Now, what I want to encourage you to do is pause the video and think about how we might um, extend this function or modify this function to work for any base, not just binary digits. Okay, if you've paused the video and you've given this a try, then let's give it a shot together. So instead of calling it binary digits, I uh, recommend that we just call this entire thing and we just get rid of the word binary. So whatever number we're given, we're just given some digits. And what we're also gonna pass in is the base that we want to operate on. And the base in this example so far was two, but it could be anything, right? It could be base 10. Um, so this is the only place, the only other place that we have to modify. Everything else just kind of works already. And let's run this again. And say two decimal, let's invoke it with base two. This should still return the same result, and it does. But now what you can do is you can pass in any base you want. So for example, what would base, what would this uh, amount to in base five? Also, can you guess what this would amount to in base 10? Well, just, it reads very naturally. It's basically the same thing that we're that we're giving it. Now, how does our two decimal function compare with our traditional approach? I think actually this is a case where the traditional approach is easier to reason about, but it comes at a cost. Now, the the reason it's easier to reason about is because when you when you do everything in one step here. You're doing it very incrementally and you're doing it in a sort of step-by-step -step way. And so you don't really have to think about what these columns mean and that you're essentially reducing it at the end using plus because you're not doing it at the very end, you're doing it at every step. So this might be a little bit easier to reason about, but it comes at the cost of having a function that, um, well, for one, it, it still has this very imperative style um, but the other problem is you can't really break out any of this into subcomponents that you might be able to reuse later. That's what we have now in two decimal is there's very little logic actually going on in the two decimal function because we have all these components that we have um, that we're importing, so to speak, from somewhere else like map many. Map many is an incredibly powerful function that has a lot of reach that we could use and many other places. So this is a lot more modular and changeable as a result. So I think the, um, even though this initially may be a little bit harder to reason about, I would still prefer this function over the traditional implementation of parsing binary digits. And there you have it. This is our function to parse a binary digit.